Thinking Aloud Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring U.S. military interest in the ostensible paranormal. With me is Dr. John Alexander, retired senior military officer with 32 years experience in the military. He is one of the foremost proponents, actually, of military interest in the paranormal. Back in 1989, he authored a classic paper titled The New Mental Battlefield, which was published in Military Review, a very important uh, Journal of uh, Military Science. Dr. Alexander is also author of Reality Denied, First-Hand Experience with Things That Can't Happen But Did. His other titles include Future War and also UFOs, Myths, Conspiracies, and Reality. Welcome, John. Well, thank you, Jeffrey. Glad to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you, and um, I think a good place to start, since you, you were in the military for decades. and yeah, 32 years. 32 years, so uh, you've seen it from many different points of view, and I know that uh, uh, one experience that you have that we, is common amongst uh, combat veterans, or at least I should say it's not uncommon, is uh, when you were in Vietnam, uh, you had an experience, one might think of it as telepathic or synchronistic, but it saved your life. Uh, probably, or at least my legs. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about an incident where I had wandered into a uh, Viet Cong minefield. Yeah which was different from most of them, but this is one where uh, we were in a relatively familiar area. It's a jungle terrain and walking and uh, I started backing up because we were in contact mm -hmm. and all of a sudden I just stopped. And about that time the Vietnamese lieutenant started yelling, mean, mean, and I looked down and the tripwire from a mine was not only touching my heel, but I had started to put tension on it. Mm. So another few millimeters and likely would have gone off. A landmine right at your feet. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and you don't know why you stopped at that moment. And, uh, no, that, that's the interesting part. And I've interviewed hundreds of mm. military uh, personnel from combat situations. And as you mentioned earlier, this is a common kind of experience. Mm -hmm. uh, there's something known as the, the point man syndrome, if you will. Uh, and the, uh, this is, the point man is the guy who has to go first when you're on patrol. And units have learned when certain guys are in the front, things are safe because they perceive danger where others might just stumble into it. Mm -hmm. So it's it's fairly well known and uh, happens, kind of, it's happened in every war. This mm -hmm. is not unique to Vietnam or any situation. It's, I think, the sensing of being in danger mm -hmm. and literally life preservation. Mm -hmm. Now you could attribute some of that to chance, but I know that the uh, military is actually very interested if can they cultivate this kind of a faculty or at least identify individuals who seem to possess it? Well, actually that varies and a lot of this and the things we'll discuss about the military applications are personality dependent. Mm -hmm. It's a huge organization, tends to be quite conservative, but you have enough people who have had unusual experiences and they're willing to explore these things and there are others who say nonsense, uh, you know, Crazy, they would attribute it all to what you said, just pure chance. Mm -hmm. Well, your service in the military occurred at a time when uh, some of the uh, higher up uh, commanding officers, uh, such as General Bert Stubblebein, with whom you worked, were uh, openly uh, supporting uh, interest in the paranormal. Yes. Uh, th there were several. This is after the Vietnam era. It was at a time when we were rebuilding the military. Uh, we were a hollow army. 
Uh, we had people uh, like Shai Meyer, the chief of staff of the Army level, who was giving a lot of leeway to mm -hmm. people to go out and explore a wide range of uh, interests mm -hmm. uh, because we they were broken and they knew it and said, how do we go about fixing things? This is where this task force Delta came along as well. Yeah. But of course, with Bert, uh, he was the head of Intelligence and Security Command. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a worldwide organization geared at looking at uh, adversaries, Soviet Union predominantly mm -hmm. at that time. We we're talking early 80s. Um, and one of our concerns was that uh, had been blindsided a few times. Uh, Sputnik is the classic example, but there yeah. were others mm -hmm. where things suddenly appeared, technological developments that we had missed. And in uh, Bert's position, you know, they're not supposed to miss these things. Right. And his message to his subordinate commanders was, do not just disregard things because you don't understand it. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and report things that, you know, hence the, uh, you know, can't happen but did, and we saw those repeatedly. Well, for example, uh, this, this is a time when there is a lot of interest in the paranormal and the culture as a whole and in the human potential movement. So the, uh, I gather that people in the military felt it's important for them to stay on top of these kinds of developments. If, if the human potential field could help uh, develop better soldiers, uh, they wanted to know about it. Yes. Uh, you'll also remember, you know, the psychic discoveries behind the Iron Curtain, which was a critical book that came out and it really did influence. 1969, I believe. Yeah, had come out and had talked about things that uh, ostensibly the Soviet uh, military was uh, engaged in. And it did spur us uh, quite a bit to look at this wide range of other mm -hmm. topics from human potential to the psychic. And yeah. Remember, we're working with NLP, for instance. Neuro-linguistic programming. Right. That uh, at different times, I had both Richard Bandler and John Grinder and Tony Robbins, mm -hmm. who was not known at that time, but had them all under contract. Yeah. And we were specifically looking at this issue of improving people. Now, NLP you know, was designed as a therapeutic modality. Mm -hmm. now, how do you fix broken people? Our problem was different. We had really good people, so the question was, how do we take really good people and make them excellent, mm -hmm. improve the best of the best? Yeah. Well, uh, one area that's received a fair amount of publicity is the use of uh, dowsers. I, I believe it uh, occurred in Vietnam. Yes, it did. Well, I had met uh, Zeborg Harvlich, who mm -hmm. was a, a head of the uh, American Dowsing Society and whatnot, lived in uh, Northern Virginia, had a chance to go down and meet with him. But one of the things that he had contracted with down at Fort Belvoir was they had, for pre-deployment training, a Viet Cong village, if you will, where people would go into. Mm -hmm. And of course, one of the big problems we had was hidden weapons, mines, all kinds of material, yeah. and usually underground. So what he had done is designed, literally teaching folks how to douse, mm -hmm. uh, he literally sticks in hand going mm -hmm. out there and using that to discover hidden weapons. Mm -hmm. And uh, would you say it was successful? Oh yes, it was quite successful. Mm -hmm. um, again, it, many of these people were probably doing it on their own. Mm -hmm. Remember, we had kids that, uh, hate to be pejorative, but coming from the backwoods where finding water and things of that was, you know, part of their culture. Sure. And, uh, yeah, they would uh, use the literally old willow stick or L rods or things like that and find stuff. Mm hmm. Well, and of course, it's now very well known that uh, another technique, which I think is akin to dowsing, remote viewing, was uh, actively pursued by the military and uh, uh, under uh, the auspices, I think, of uh, 
General Stubblebine and also... Well, there were, there were several, but Bert was key. Yeah. And uh, the difference between that and some of these other anecdotal things, this is what we call a program of record. Mm -hmm. And I know you've had Joe McMonagall and Paul Smith and some of the other remote viewers. And so, I mean, we're talking about a formalized program. It, it was a formal program, and it included laboratory research in addition. Well, that's what I was going to say. The, uh, there's a research and development piece of it. Yeah. How do you do this stuff? Mm -hmm. But there was also an act component trying to provide information on hard targets uh, that uh, using the remote viewers against you know real world situations mm -hmm. such as what happened in Iran when our people were captured there what happened in Beirut uh, the Dozier file the Brigadier General who was captured by the Red Brigade yeah so these were very real world things but you also had the R&D component that's, you know, how does this stuff work? Yeah. The military funded uh, that work, I think, to the tune of about $20 million over a 20-year period. Yes, all right. But, and uh, $20 million may be big for your wallet or certainly my checking account. Yeah. By Army Research and Development Standards, we're talking lunch money, mm -hmm. you know. But very important and that they did get actively involved and, and the point of being a program of record, we're reporting this to Congress. Mm -hmm. So you've got line items in the budget, and you know it's very formally done. Most of the other things we did were at a funding level low enough you didn't have to really report it. Yeah. And that's where the personality-dependent issues came in. Mm -hmm. Now, I g gather from your recent book, Reality Denied, that you actually monitored many uh, contracts that had to do with paranormal investigations. Well, some of them. We did some wild and wonderful things. Yeah. Uh, one of the areas that I was personally most involved in probably was psychokinesis, mm -hmm. the metal bending uh, capabilities. And, and, and in particular, uh, spoon bending parties. Right. We had uh, Jack Hauk is the one who developed it. I know Uri Geller who did the forward uh, for the book, but the, mm -hmm. the premise of the spoon bending parties came from Uri's capability to, yeah. to uh, bend well, the spoons. Many people won't remember this. I was around at the time and, and you were too. I, I actually sponsored Uri Geller's first major public appearance in the United States oh, back right. in 1972. And uh, at the time it was like a phenomenon because uh, he would get on the radio or on TV and demonstrate uh, what appeared to be psychokinetic metal bending, but right. the phone lines would start ringing and uh, I was at KPFA radio in Berkeley, people in their homes were reporting uh, cutlery bending and watches uh, that hadn't worked for years all of a sudden starting. Yes. Well, we did. Uh, what happened was Jack Hauk, who was an aerospace engineer at McDonnell Douglas, had seen this and then developed a format that became uh, teachable. Mm -hmm. And we were very interested in it. Um, uh, with Uri Geller, one of the most amazing incidents that happened, he was giving a presentation in the U.S. Capitol itself. And present were a couple of senators, congressmen, mostly staffers mm -hmm. and whatnot. As I recall from your book, he really wanted to talk about the military situation in Israel. Well, he was talking. What he wanted to talk about was the plight of Soviet Jews uh -huh. and them being able to come to to Israel. Uh -huh. But that was, it was a political aspect of that. That was his primary mm -hmm. interest. And of course, everybody said, "Bend something, bend something," and he goes. I haven't got anything. Yeah. Now, we were in a skip, which is a specialized, compartmented... Uh, secure room. Uh, secure room. So, and he, what, importantly, he did not say, oh, I just happened to have one in my pocket. <laughs> they literally went out and got one from the guard's coffee cup, mm -hmm. and he came in, and importantly, because I'm sitting about the distance that uh, we are right now, mm -hmm. and he's holding it with the bowl here, brings his finger down, not... He, the fingers did not go around it, touching this thing bent up. Mm -hmm. And then, related to what you said earlier, he put it on the back of the chair and he went on talking and the spoon continued to bend while he's talking and not even paying attention and to it. No one is touching it at that point. No, it's sitting on the, then it fell on the floor and somehow ended up in my pocket. <laughs> I still have it. <laughs> well, 
Now, many people think, uh, due to the publicity from the, the skeptics, or I'm going to call them pseudo-skeptics, uh, who, uh, because that's what they are, and who, who hounded Uri Geller and, and proclaimed wildly that he's got to be a fraud. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you've known Uri for many years, as have I. Yeah. What's your opinion? Is, does he ever engage in fraud? Well, I can't speak to ever. I mean, that's okay. a very broad statement. Yeah. Not in my experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I like his comment, uh, you know, when people say, well, if you're so psychic, why aren't you rich? And he says, I am. Yeah. And he has based it on, this has to do with dowsing for minerals. That's where most of his wealth has come from, mm -hmm. not from spoon bending. And those yeah. performances are, are interesting. Mm -hmm. But... Um, yeah, I was going out with, around the world looking for various minerals for people who have made enough money from it that. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, like the Rio Tinto Mining Company, yeah. for for example. Yeah, very interesting career. And well, Pemex was one of the big ones in Mexico. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, in fact, he developed a close relationship, as I recall, with the president of Mexico at the time and his Which wife. Which got him into a bit of trouble in the U.S. Uh -huh. You know, there's an infamous story that I was able to check out because there's a Secret Service agent who lives in our area now. Oh, yes. But what happened was the president of Mexico made him a law enforcement officer and gave him a gun. Lopez Garcia was uh, yeah. that the fellow? With, uh, but the... The point was, he yeah. was flying from Mexico City to London, yeah. stopped in JFK, mm -hmm. and Had was the gun. carrying a gun, yeah. and they confiscated it. Mm -hmm. And then what happened was that uh, this uh, Secret Service agent got involved and found, no, he really is a Mexican official, mm -hmm. had been granted that authority, uh, and then went on to help them with Son of Sam. Uh huh. Help the New York police. Help the New York police, right. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very significant. That was a big case. And, yeah. and Geller's involvement in it has never been really publicized to my knowledge. Well, the, the story is out there, but it's real. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he had done is they were, he had identified the location of Berkowitz. Uh, and it was from that, and they started looking at parking tickets. You know, he was arrested for a parking ticket. And sure enough, the parking ticket, you know, oh, was I one see. of the key pieces uh -huh. in putting the Son of Sam case together. Mm -hmm. In any case, back to the spoon bending parties, you uh, became um, a uh, what would what you call it? A a leader of spoon bending parties. Oh yes, we we did. I had a dozens, I don't know how many. I, I lost track. See, this mm -hmm. is where Jack Houck was good because yeah. he was an, an engineer and an invented data collector. Mm -hmm. And every party, he kept track of who was there and how many and how many spoons that were bent. Our interest was a little different. It wasn't so much in just bending the spoons, but it gets back to the issue I mentioned before about being blindsided. Mm -hmm. Because what Subblevine was interested in using this to his commander to say, okay, you didn't think this could happen. It did. You've experienced or seen the experience of it. Remember that when you go back to your organizations and you start getting reports that you don't fully understand. Mm -hmm. They may be wrong, yeah. but don't just disregard it mm -hmm. a priori, which we had done in too many cases. Well, and, and certainly when it comes to the paranormal and the culture in general, especially amongst educated people, professionals and the like, when they encounter something paranormal, the tendency is to uh, push it aside, to ignore it, to pretend it didn't happen. Very much. I, I had people who attended PK parties, the spoon bending parties, who you talk to them later, and so, well, I wasn't there, or that didn't happen. Yeah. I've thought about it, it couldn't have happened, so even though it, they had had personal experience, chose to disregard it. Now, you've hit on a key issue, and I don't know if you want to digress a bit, and that has to do with belief systems. Mm -hmm. But I, I think this is really key. As you know, I do work with other countries around the world, and particularly Brazil. The point here is we grew up in the Western educational system, very materialistically oriented. You know, everything cut it into smaller and smaller pieces. The difference between here and, say, Brazil, and I deal with very senior people down there, is they went to the same educational systems, but culturally are willing to accept a spiritual world or the spiritist kinds of things go on. And they can integrate mm -hmm. 
those concepts that uh, apparently are, are seemingly incongruent. Yeah. Uh, but I would argue they aren't. But mm -hmm. we just disregard it for all the issues that uh, you articulated. Well, I think in uh, North America, people are, uh, professionals in particular, are afraid they'll be laughed at. Uh, yeah. And there are people who make a point of laughing at, at them, whereas in a culture uh, like Brazil, this is not considered a laughing matter in the same no, way. They, they, well, I, the, one of the things I've tried to do in the book, I talk about many of the issues that happen to me, but the real point is these happen to everybody. Mm -hmm. And one of, I've got a couple of agenda items that I admit to. One is to try to make it uh, more permissible for best and brightest scientists uh, to get involved in these areas. Mm -hmm. And another is to get people to talk about it. Yeah. Because I really don't like the word paranormal because these things are normal, mm -hmm. it, but maybe rare, yeah. but that doesn't mean that they are different from. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this has to do with you know, vocabulary or thinking about it. We're willing to relegate it to weird, uh, terribly complex, whatever we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And as you know, I've, I've dealt with a wide range of phenomena. I do think they're all re interrelated. I do think that consciousness is a key piece of this. I point out that, you know, whatever we're dealing with is at least as complex as mm -hmm. cancer or AIDS. And I think one of the things that will be very helpful is for people to tell other people about the things that have happened to them. Mm -hmm. ESP, you know, clairvoyant experiences, precognition, uh, near-death experiences, far more common than most people believe. And you have gone out of your way to seek out these experiences and uh, study them. And, and you make a point of looking for the most bizarre experiences. So I commend you for that. Well, one of my, again, admonitions to people is go do it. Uh -huh. uh, it's not just a matter of studying it or reading papers on it or that. Uh, these experiences are available basically to anybody who gets involved. And as I said, most people have had them just mm -hmm. on a continuous basis. They just sometimes don't recognize it, but on others, uh, they just don't want to sound crazy, mm -hmm. you know. And you know, to even friends and family, let alone telling scientists yeah. or doctors. We, I have to say, though, you were in something of a privileged position, being a military officer and having a general who was supporting your uh, interest in the paranormal and encouraging you to go out and find new unexplained things. Yes, we did. This was operating under General Stubblebein. Uh, the, uh, there were several others, but one of the things I'd point out is this is generally personality dependent. Mm -hmm. Because when Bert retired, I mean, these efforts got, uh, well, it got transferred initially and later killed, and it all was, it, a lot of it had to do with zero sum game funding uh, process, but a sure. lot of it was, you know, personality. Who is going to uh, support these efforts? Well, I think there are real questions about whether large bureaucracies in general are capable of managing uh, research programs in parapsychology. Well, I've done a lot of work in creativity, mm -hmm. and my point there to most people is be careful what you ask for. These uh, organizations all state, we want to be creative, we want to do that, and you say, well, maybe not that creative, you know, because people come in. And if you're going to do work with creativity, you've also got to uh, reinforce failure. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, most of, and this is where the military is particularly bad, they're very uh, results-oriented. And uh, sort of failure is not an option, is the mindset. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to be really creative, um, you're going to fail sometimes, because as a it pointed out, if, if you're almost getting the answer you expect, you're nowhere close to the edge. Mm -hmm. Well, you uh, write in your book, Reality Denied, about uh, some experiences that were technically considered failures, but that you believe uh, had a lot of merit to them. One of them uh, you refer to uh, is known as the Hutchinson effect. Yes. Uh, that, that was one that is really uh, highly controversial. It began, uh, George Hathaway and another Canadian had shown us a film of some things that looked 
really, really strange. We had items that were levitating, uh, accelerating, uh, burning. One of the r problems was the range of effects. Yeah. Uh, so in, in that case, I actually paid them to recreate the situation, mm -hmm. uh, which they did with John Hutchison, who was your worst nightmare. Nice guy, uh, but no scientific background he, he, whatsoever. He was the inventor. Yeah, he was the, I mean, you talk about the, the, the mad inventor, that yeah. was him. Mm -hmm. And actually, he had discovered a number of these things kind of spontaneously. Um, he was interested in sparks. And so in, initially, he was sitting in his room. He had all these contraptions. Yeah. One of the things he had done is look at Nikola Tesla mm -hmm. and look at what's the pictures of his uh, workbench. And from that, try to figure out what was going on. He, he would buy used equipment of various oh, types. Yeah. And, and, and absolutely no control over the situation yeah. or anything. Um, what happened in the meantime is he got kicked out of his apartment because he was interfering. Remember, the television went, you know, through mm -hmm. the air in, in those days. The and neighbors so, were complaining. Yeah, it, it was. Uh, the neighbors were not happy, shall we say. Yeah. Um, but the U.S. military took an interest. Well, we did uh, for a while. Uh, the the other the problem was that we had agreed we would have uh, a show and tell mm -hmm. at a specific point. There were some things that happened that I am personally convinced happened. I had given him a number of samples, mm -hmm. and we had them under controlled conditions. One of the most interesting, we had a, uh, some small molybdenum rods. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very strong, and I had them for the PK parties, and nobody had ever been able to bend one. Mm -hmm. And damned if uh, when I went up there, they gave me one with a slight S-curve oh. uh, in it. Um, so what happened though is we had uh, the show and tell date and I had uh, you know, four guys from INSCOM including myself and two from Los Alamos and one of them was one of the people you've discussed before and this is the uh, it just flat debunker mm -hmm. you know and um, the problem was that during the time when things were supposed to take place nothing happened. And most unfortunate, what instead of writing a report, we came, we saw nothing happen. They wrote a scathing report, and actually suggested that Tom Bearden, you know, mm. local U.S. guy, had slipped into the country somehow and manipulated. It had absolutely nothing to do with it. <laughs> um, but that was enough to kill, you know, our particular ones. I couldn't get further funding on it. Yeah. But here's one where Jack Hawk and McDonald Douglas came along and supported it. John, to this day, continues to have strange things happen. John Hutchinson. Yes. The problem, frankly, is control. Mm -hmm. You know, can, you cannot control the effects, but they're certainly yeah. interesting. I, I And we'll show some pictures because uh, from your book so that our viewers can get a yeah. feeling oh, for... Oh, some of the material we saw. And, for instance, uh, they showed me had a uh, crankshaft. Remember, he's grabbing crap mm -hmm. literally out of the junkyard. Yeah. And had exposed to it, they took it to BC Hydro for testing. And the same piece of metal on one end is case hardened steel, on the other end is, you know, soft as lead. Uh -huh. And it just from being exposed to things. Mm -hmm. We had PVC that literally was pulverized and disappeared. Another one, it took a rat tail file put it between two wooden boards, put it in there, it lit up just like, remember the old incandescent light uh -huh, bulbs, sure. we have a wire across there, and just like that, it lights up, got to the point the whole file, which is as big as my finger, just lit up and, you know, broke apart. Split in two. The interesting piece was, you know, this had been mm -hmm. white hot, they, they reached in and picked it up and it was cold. That was pretty risky. Yes. <laughs> But the problem, again, it gets uh -huh. back to control. I mean, yeah. scientists want things that are, you know, can be replicated sure. on a routine basis. Well, but sometimes it takes a long time before you get there. Sure. I mean, you mentioned the incandescent light bulb. As I recall, Edison tried like thousands of uh, filaments before he found the, the tungsten that actually uh, worked the best. Right. 
It, it doesn't always happen overnight. And, and this, by the way, I mean, this is just being exposed to the field. It wasn't wired into anything. It was uh -huh. just the fields mm -hmm. that, that he was generating. But he couldn't control the field. And, and frequently, we have stuff with cameras watching it, and you'd be staring at it, and something happens just off camera. I know yeah. we've talked about that with mm -hmm. Skinwalker Ranch and places like that mm -hmm. as well. Like, precognitive Sandian phenomena, but it occurs in spades in these things. Very frustrating from a research perspective. Well, I know in your book you speculate that this might be what is known as a psychotronic effect. I, I don't understand the effect, but a psychotronic I would I would buy, certainly, yes. Yeah. In, other, in other words, as, as I recall, you talked to Hutchinson and asked him, are you doing any of this? Well, that, are you, uh, you know, that's are you the agent? That's another key point, because mm -hmm. um, when I, I talked to John, I said, are you part of the system? Mm -hmm. In other words, he's physically interacting with it yeah. at a psychic mm -hmm. level. Uh, he said yes. Uh, I've had mixed response uh, from that. Uh, one side observed him say he gets he would get he said he could tell it was going to happen because he'd get excited and then the event would happen. The other would say no, the event would happen and then he'd get excited. So yeah. it's kind of hard to tell. But there, it's a funny thing because you know conventionally we think of subject and object as being distinct from each other, right. and. Uh, Yet there's a, a lot of theoretical work, uh, especially coming out of quantum physics, that says that's an illusion, the sub subjective and objective. That it's all one system. All is Maya. <laughs> well, now, speaking of uh, the ability of somebody to uh, know in advance when something is going to happen, uh, you describe in your book, it's worth mentioning, a, a, a case in, in which uh, you were visiting uh, some people who had had many uh, paranormal experiences associated with orbs and lights in the sky and UFOs. And on one occasion, uh, you witnessed something similar. If you're talking about the Chris uh, Bledsoe case, yes. mm -hmm. uh, that could be an entire program like, with the complexity of it, but it's absolutely real. Uh, the uh, orb aspect actually happened here. Uh, we were up on Mount Charleston. He and some other friends were visiting Las Vegas. We went up on Mo Mount Charleston to literally play games with UFOs. We were sending up balloons with uh, chem lights on them and things like that. So mm -hmm. if people looked, they did see a UFO. <laughs> but what was interesting is I had taken a series of photographs and at times, uh, they would be perfectly clear, and then the next frame, you know, you're seeing these orbs uh, uh -huh. appearing in there. I get, on a regular, relatively routine basis, I get a video taken from him. Some of these, by the way, are in the visual spectrum. Mm -hmm. You know, you have some question where, you know, once you've developed film or however it's working yeah. now with digital technology, you see these things. But they have interaction, like I say, where you can actually see. Will you the, describe a, a, an instance where you were with him on his property? And uh, uh, at one point he he said, I can feel they're coming. Oh, that that's a bit different. Yeah. Uh, no, that we had gone down to the Cape Fear River mm -hmm. uh, where his initial experience had happened. Yeah. By the way, this is a, thing that, a series of incidents that are continuing to this day. This is in, was it North or South North, Carolina? North Carolina. North Carolina. Near, near Fayetteville. Mm -hmm. And we had gone on the Cape Fear River, and he had explained where he'd seen the UFOs and what their interactions had been and hiding from creepy crawlers. I mean, a terribly complex case. Yeah. Went back up to uh, the car. It's now it become dark. Uh, Victoria and his daughter Emily had gotten in the back seat, and Chris mm -hmm. and I were leaning against the fender. Your wife, Victoria. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the... Um, uh, he's describing, showing me where things are, what the relative positions were, and all of a sudden, oh, I think they're here. And within, you know, maybe 10 seconds, this thing pops into view and goes zipping off. Yeah. And it didn't fly in from someplace. I mean, it literally materialized and, and went and zipping off to the that. south. And I saw it. And the point here is the temporal relationship mm -hmm. between him saying, 
you know, something's going to happen, right. and then it happening. Because when we were talking about Hutchinson earlier, he, he had done something similar. And yeah, well, it, he had said that. I can say, I, um, there's something going on. But the, the, the problem with John Hutchinson is these things happen kind of all the time, but the same way in an uncontrolled basis. Yeah. And you never know what mm -hmm. what's going to happen or when. Yeah. Well, you know, your book is so rich. Uh, there are probably uh, 50 different examples of, of some of these case studies that you were involved in. But getting back to the military, you achieved a certain amount of notoriety because of, of your association with a popular film, Men Who Stare at Goats. And well, that came along later, but yes. Uh, but, but it does have to do with uh, your background in the martial arts and military interest in uh, uh, w what can be done uh, using martial arts techniques, uh, particularly for uh, soldiers who have been captured. The, uh, yeah, well, first of all, Goats was based on a book by the same name by John Ronson. And mm -hmm. in the book, there's no doubt who we are. Mm -hmm. uh, they used are real names. Uh, the problem that I saw was he took about this much truth and he wrote this much and then they made the movie. <laughs> uh, so Clooney is sort of a composite uh, character. Um, it, the, um, the, the point was that A, goats never died from being stared at, mm -hmm. but they did apply something called dim mac, mm -hmm. which is known as the death touch, which basically is, is a high-level martial arts system, uh, again, if you believe it, but it, you have to understand how key flows, mm -hmm. how acupuncture works, and things like that. And the idea is they would hit the goat, and then at a later time, it's not like bang, and the right. goat goes down. You touch it, and it was like 12 hours later, mm -hmm. all of a sudden the goat goes boop. And the point was that, um, and I saw the necropsy on this, the uh, death was so fast that the heart didn't even contract. I've tried talking to cardiologists and mm -hmm. say, how, how is it? Because normally with in the death throes, you know, your heart would contract, but the ventricles were full of blood. Mm -hmm. The more interesting aspect to me is I saw, the again, the necropsy across the thoracic region. You saw a line going through there. And this is similar, if you've seen how bullets transit a, a yeah. body going through and then radiating energy, the, you saw this pathway of energy going mm -hmm. across the body, but no wound of ensign or wound of exit. Mm -hmm. So this is a technique that uh, the military took some interest in. Well, there were certain people. What had happened was that they had created a course called Survival, Evasion, Resistance, and Escape, or Siri. Mm -hmm. And the guy they brought in was Nick Rowe. And Nick had been a prisoner uh, of the Viet Cong for five years. Just so happens he was in my general area in the Delta. We'd get stories about him, you know, being seen, a round eye being seen with the, with the Viet Cong. Mm -hmm. Recovered him just as I was uh, leaving, 69, uh, mm -hmm. managed to escape. But they brought him and said, who better to run an uh, evasion course than mm -hmm. somebody with five years personal experience? And yeah. one of the things he had found was he could use mental techniques, mm -hmm. not to do big things. Mm -hmm. This idea of Rambo, you're gonna jump up and whip ass and all that, that's not happening after you've been in captivity. Mm -hmm. um, but he found that he could influence the guards, maybe just to walk a little farther, to look someplace for a while, giving them time to do something else. So what he did is sent a couple of medics out to look at this range of technology, including uh, Dim Mac. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that, that's what they were doing. And it was, as I said, captured on film. But the, there really is a goat lab there. Mm -hmm. And uh, a, a bit sensitive. But what we it, it's, it's there to train medics so that the first gunshot wound you see is not a human on the battlefield. <laughs> well. Uh, to shift gears a bit, um, another area that you were involved in uh, helping the military take a closer look at is the research of Cleve Baxter. 
Yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, we did, and I've done a, a whole chapter in there. Cleve mm -hmm. Baxter is uh, the one some people will know of who is getting communication from plants. He's featured very extensively in, in the classic book, The Secret Life of Plants. Correct. Mm -hmm. And what actually it started with a, a failed experiment, if you will. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he had a plant in his uh, office. He, yeah, but, he, he was a lie detector expert, well, basically. Yeah, now, Cleve, first of all, was the guy who developed the polygraph system as we know. Not the polygraph, but the system mm -hmm. that is still used to this day, the oh. Baxter Comparative Zone system. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a bachelor interested in a range of phenomena, including astrology and whatnot. But, but the question that he had is, I've got a plant here. If I pour water on the roots, how long does it take the liquid to reach the leaves? Mm -hmm. So he hooked up a plant, they have GSR, the galvanic skin response, which basically is measuring liquid, um, and saw that, but he forgot about it. Mm. And he left it running, and it was hooked up to the polygraph, so he mm. had a chart going. And over time, he noticed, you know, periodically, they're getting wiggles, they're mm -hmm. getting reports on the, on the chart. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I said, what's that? So then long and evolved set of experiments, but he found out that plants referred to uh, things like touch, pain, or, uh, even thoughts. You know, of people in their vicinity. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. that as well. Mm -hmm. Well, he also, he, he was the one who said he'd, cut, he'd tear a leaf and he'd see a reflip, uh, mm -hmm. remark on the graph. He would burn the leaf, and then he said he found that if he just thought about burning the leaf, it was enough to get a response. Mm -hmm. Fast forward a number of iterations, yeah. and so we found that there were oral leukocytes, i.e. The, the white cells uh, from the mouth, and mm -hmm. he started doing experimentation with those. And that's where I came in yeah. and developed a, a parallel system. I had him under contract. He showed us how to uh, how to work it. But what we did basically is we had we take white cells out, centrifuge them, put them in a small uh, container with electrodes in it, mm -hmm. in a shielded cage yeah. at, a, at a distance. So and the white cells presumably are going to react to uh, the emotions of, of the donor. Well, that's what we thought. Now, mm -hmm. of course, there is no, if you have the materialistic viewpoint, that shouldn't happen. Right. I mean, how can you take white cells from your mouth and have them respond at a distance? And we had experiences up to uh, you know, 50 miles away, frankly, mm -hmm. where I'd left the cells running. The classic uh, experiment, though, was that uh, we, uh, the Army had asked National Academy of Science, National Research Council, to do a study on a wide range of uh, phenomena. Mm -hmm. And I had appeared before them uh, several times. So we invited them. They were going to meet at the Salk Institute in San Diego. And that's where Cleve's, uh, uh, well, his office was very close to that. Mm -hmm. We arranged for them to come in. Uh, so I arrived first. And, you know, if you're going to run experiments before the academy, you want to make sure it's working. Mm -hmm. So that day, I donated my white cells just to make sure the damn thing's working. You know, yeah. there was nothing secret about it. And then the, the plan was that we were gonna take all of the people into the classroom, but two of them would go with his lab assistant to this other wing of the building at some distance away, several hundred feet away, uh, concrete walls and all of that in between. Um, so the, again, the thesis was that uh, Clave would explain the experiment, said, you gotta do it quickly, we gotta keep their attention. Yeah. I would get up in a minute or two and say, okay, I've independently replicated the experience. Uh, and then we would take them to the lab and, and they would get to see it for themselves. Well, Cleve turned out to be one of the people, if you ask him what time it is, he'd give you the history of chronometers. <laughs> Meaning he was running on and on. He was and boring getting, your uh, yeah. very respectable audience. Yes, and, I, and I'm getting nervous, frankly. Mm -hmm. I mean, geez, we gotta spit up. So finally, it becomes my turn to talk. And so I start telling him. Now remember, the thesis is it's responding to your emotional state. Mm -hmm. 
About 90 seconds later, the door flies open, and in runs the lab assistant and says, what happened a minute and a half ago? I said, well, that's when I started talking. And it says, you look over there, the graph is going wild. For hours it had been, you know, just like this. Mm -hmm. And suddenly they've got you know, hitting the stoppers uh, on the As soon the as chart. you started speaking. And this one I had started. Now, I can tell you that telling the National Academy of Science uh, members that the universe is not built the way they think it is can be an emotionally stimulating mm -hmm. event. Sure. And then it went along with this high beam, and then it dropped off. And then when I walk in the room, you see a blip, and then uh -huh. it got torn off because the, they were looking at the graph and just tore it off the machine. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, not a word in the report about it. From the National Academy. Yeah. I see. Well, it was, I guess, from their point of view, maybe an unplanned event, not a formal experiment. Well, I, I hadn't. Plan, like I said, we had, I had actually forgotten yeah. that the uh, mm -hmm. thing was running. We did not set it up to monitor mm -hmm. me. I, I just wanted to make sure yeah. was, ever, the graphs were working the way it was supposed to. Mm -hmm. We were going to take two of their people, uh, have them do it. Uh, interesting anecdote that people who work in this field would uh, might appreciate. They, uh, they're in there. We went over to the lab finally, and they've looked at the chart, and Cleve is describing, you know, what's going on. And one of the donors is sitting, just staring intently, and stops and goes, and you know, it goes, ah, you see, it says, I tried to make it move, and nothing happened. As soon as I stopped, it jumped. You know, <laughs> parapsychologists say, but of course, yeah. Huh? That's often how it works. Yes. You have to try, 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 and then relax. Yes. Uh -huh. That's when he relaxed. But the, he took it as confirmation that it didn't work right. because of his uh, predisposition. Well, and I gather uh, these days the, the military is not publicly or actively you know, pursuing these kinds of projects. Well, you're back to the same issue that we had even then. That's personality dependent. Mm -hmm. And... You know, when I worked in the Pentagon, I used to run around and say, looking for this guy, says the Pentagon says this. And the Pentagon doesn't say anything. It's a big stone building. Yeah. The military is made up with, you know, hundreds of thousands, literally millions of people. Right. And they come with a wide range of belief system and interest. But they also come with a wide range of people who have had these experiences. No doubt. And some of them, once they get, it's, it's like Bert didn't, you know, when he started in the Army, he didn't say, I'm going to go do sponsored remote viewing. And that. it wasn't until he got senior enough that you know, he was in a position mm -hmm. where he could make some of these things happen. Yeah. And unfortunately, that's the way a lot of these things happen. But again, the, the people have these experiences, and, you know, when they get to position, some of them are willing to do it. Now, military generally is risk aversive. So it it is not career enhanced, like pilots generally don't report UFO experiences mm -hmm. because it's not what we call career enhancing. Yeah. In, in fact, uh, as far as I know, many of the people who were in the remote viewing program felt that was the end of their uh, advancement. Once they'd been in that program, there's no further well, possibility. In, in of general, that was true. Yeah. Yeah. It, mm -hmm. it was, uh, there were definitely career blocks, but mm -hmm. there um, there, there was a program uh, where people could get into highly specializing, but you had very definite limits as to how far you were going to advance. So, yeah. like I say, if your idea was to make rank and move up, uh, for, for most of people, it was a career-ending experience. Mm -hmm. Well, John Alexander, I hope that uh a conversation like ours and the books that you're writing will uh, inspire some people to uh, continue the tradition of exploration that uh, you have certainly embodied. Well, I hope they will go do it and just admit what's already going on in their life. Mm -hmm. John, thank you so much for being with me. Okay, well, thank you. And thank you for being with us. Thank you.